all recorded. This is the NeoBooks call on Monday, November 27, 2023. Uh, Klaus is in transit from San Francisco back to Bend, and we're catching up on uh, NeoBooks and such. Um, and Klaus, go go ahead. Your image is frozen, so you may actually be uh, be out of reach. There we go. You're back. Yeah, why don't I turn my camera off? That will uh, probably help. Yeah, better. Yeah, so even even uh, with people that I'm uh, partnered with on LinkedIn, um, they are they are ideas floating to. Um, change into quasi-regenerative practices that are not really restoring uh, the soil. And um, these are basically attempts to, to maintain monocrop practices with with some adjustments. And um, that's just not going to work. And I think one, one item that came out in Volume 1 is that the challenge for us is really to restore the soil so that the soil restores the hydrologic cycles. So that, that turned out to be the core, the core conclusion that came out of the uh, AI driven volume one. Um, so I'm I'm pondering, you know, how to express this in volume two mm -hmm. in ways that, that is accepted. And the other thing um I'm really uh, wanting to focus on is to make this more digestible and more positive, you know, because they are constructive ways to engage. Um, and they can be they can be presented in ways that are fun and participatory and um, and actionable and so on. Uh, and that's really what I want to do, you know, is to create uh, to create maybe a series of uh, of letters, or, you know, create a blog, uh, and I started working on Substack to, um, to uh, find a way to, to publish. You know, the, the, these things maybe come out once a week or once every other week with uh, an article that that sort of builds up towards um, uh, what we do. Now you're now you're breaking up on us too much to understand, Klaus. I we we I got you on, until the last like eight words, and then oh. uh, then you broke up a bunch. Uh, Rick Klaus is driving uh, with family from San Francisco back up to Bend, so he's on on the road, zooming in. Uh, do you want to try that last little bit again, Klaus? Uh, we may have lost Klaus altogether. Um, and the comments I had, I wanted Klaus to hear, so I'll make sure that we got his connection back when we go. Uh, Rick, how's it going? It's going well. Going well, thank you. Um, we have indeed lost Klaus from the, from the call. Hopefully he'll be back. Um, good. Any, um, any news on your front? Um. I've been I, I've been trying to think. Through. Actually, I just came from a Zoom call um, this morning, and it was testing out a new platform which I'd never heard of before. I think it says uh, Go Brunch or something. Let me see if I can find it. And they did a testing of it, and the idea was to try and create more of a learning community, a little bit much more adaptable than Zoom, where you could have continuous community. Anyway, I'm just you know looking around for what, what's what's going to be the next new thing that really is designed for creating learning communities. Um, Zoom isn't, from my point of view. I mean, it's, it's, but it doesn't have a community building. So one of the things I've become fascinated with is how to, when you have a live event, how do you have follow-up where you have asynchronous communications about it? And actually, I've joined this group on civil discourse. And I don't think it's so civil, but that doesn't matter. And they're sorting out the ground rules. And I've been very proactive on that. And I, I, I've actually been calling out people on their false assumptions and projections when they respond to me. And I try and do it with a sense of equanimity um, because, you know, when people become overreactive, then they can start, you know, firing off all sorts of stuff. 
but it's not out of hand. It, it, it's not, it's just normal. But if we don't have the language to call people out when their amygdala brains are taking over the neocortical ones, then, you know, we, we get locked into this um, emotional quagmire of how to navigate these, uh, these issues. So, um, and then I, I shared a, uh, an updated um, Substat article on uh, how to co-create uh, generative dialogues and facilitate um, civil discourse and I, at a group last night. And I was just blown away by some of the reactions that I got from people. Um, and it was so informative because you just assume that people, you know, share your point of view. And until you get, you know, somebody, you know, says, well, equity is all about taking uh, things away from the deserving and giving it to the undeserved, you know, those sort of tropes, you know, and I had to call the guy out on it. I said, you know, that's a trope, you know, and um, so how, how can we, <laughs> how can we have more engaging, um, authentic conversation with candor in such a way that we can actually see whether people are willing to shift some of their points of view or not. I don't try and convince anybody of anything. I just say, this is what it is. What do you think? You know, once you get into the persuasion game, I think you've lost. Hmm. Uh, and uh, I much prefer to think as, as influence is not as a proactive outward thing, but something you attract people to, which is different. Um, and so it calls for different strategies. Anyway, that's just a few musings. From the equity muse. Exactly. <laughs> um, thanks, Rick. That's really interesting. And you've kicked up a whole mess of thoughts, um, including, a, including a bunch of conversations Pete and I have had over many a year over what is the better platform that has sync plus async plus this plus that plus note taking plus uh, you know shared ideas plus wiki dynamics it's etc. So you're you're in familiar territory for us, like looking around for for what's going to work there. And uh, Pete, Pete, if you want to jump in on that, please do now. Um, I, Rick, what what platform were you on? I'll just okay. see if I can find it actually. I think yeah. I... You said Go Brunch, but I don't know that that's a thing. But uh, yeah. And there's there have been many. No, have it is, gone. It is actually, if you go Brunch, it's it? it, yeah. GoBrunch.com go, or what? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Get creative and collaborative with Go Brunch, the ultimate virtual office and community platform for creators and startups. <clears throat> well, there it is. Yeah. And um, it's. Um, this was a demo and it was a bit, you know, people, you know, it's like anything you start off when the first time, you know, people were just stumbling over, you know, the usual sort of things. And it wasn't really tested, but I was asking them, well, what do you think the added benefits are of it? Um, and they only described the two, but it was enough for me to say, I want to look into that a little bit. So, um, Pete, you, you're far more, far more technological than I am and you are, Jerry. So I'd love to get your opinion on it. Um, and then this group, they're going to host a session where they're going to try and use it. They're trying to use Zoom and Go Brunch at the same time. And it got so confusing for people. It was, uh, you know, you either have to use one or the other. We have a friend um, named Lucas Chaffee who created something called Kiko Chat that wraps some persistent objects around Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm. And he did this kind of early pandemic and mm -hmm. uh, offered it up to a lot of communities trying to have discussions. I know that Doc Searle still uses it. Um, it doesn't look very elegant. It, he doesn't have a lot of UI experience or staffing or resources, <clears throat> but it does its job reasonably well and it, and it fixes a couple of problems of the kinds that you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, back to you in the booth, Pete. Um, I, I uh, well, it, speaking of community, I went to compare it to kind of uh, Mighty Networks disc discourse, um, you know that that flavor. But it's it, Go Brunch is more of a video platform, and so I have to swap over to remember the the video kinds of things that we've looked at. Yeah, I'm putting a link to Kiko Chat in the chat for you, Rick. Okay. <clears throat> Um, and this is a perennial problem. And um, there's a whole bunch of things that showed up during pandemic uh, that had a, a virtual space where avatars could float around and meet each other in different rooms and move around. 
Uh, I never had a great experience in any of those, uh, but that but I collect a whole bunch of these. So there's there's like lots of them out there. Uh, none of which. Do you remember one of the names, Jerry? Uh, sure. Let me. I actually I'm trying to remember the name of the one in particular that got big during. Well, uh, because I've I've had good experiences with uh, the one that SF Meetup use uh, SF uh, D Web uses. So here's it's... um virtual event platforms. Do you recognize which one? Circles was in there, but it's not the one I'm thinking about. Remo was interesting. Kiko Chat is under this this uh, thing. Uh, then there are uh, webinar. Then there are multi-party video conferencing video chat services. Here's Jitsi and Big Blue Button, and uh, a couple of those. Um, I'm still not seeing the one. It was a, a group town group. Yeah, something town. Yeah, I want to say town. I'm looking for the oh, word town. online town there. So one down there. Uh, right in this batch here. No. Oh, no. Oh, great. Go all the way to the bottom there. Second to the bottom. Up. It says Rab Rabbi died, and then above it, it says online town. Oh, oh this one. Yeah, that's that's not it. Thank you. Um, that's not the one, but it's uh, gather town. Gather town. Thank you. And so let's see. Uh, one, I don't know if you've got it listed there. Another one called Sutra. I don't uh, know Sutra. Why do I not have Gather Town in here? Is it spelled that way, Pete? Uh, sorry, not looking at your screen. Yeah, but G it's just one word. Yeah, Gather Town. Town, no space. I will yep. look it up. Uh, Sutra, I know the founder of. Uh, who is? Go ahead. Here, yeah, here's uh, Lawrence and his wife, Lawrence Sell, and his wife Natasha. Yeah, yeah I know them as well. Yeah, and I have that under Power Tools for Discourse, where it's just a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, there's yeah, just, you know, it's gather.town. Gather.town. That makes sense. I was like, I, I'm pretty certain I have it in my brain. I still am not hitting it. That's weird. I will find it and then uh, uh, try to add it and see if it finds it. And uh, then Remo is another one that's similar to that. Yep. I, and I had Remo in there. Gather Town is the one that I was specifically thinking of. And I've had good experiences with Gather Town, even though it's it's a dorky, you know, uh, 1980s avatar thing. It still works. Yeah. Interesting. There was okay. a, um, yeah, there was a virtual platform long ago, like 92, 93, called OnLive. Uh, and uh, da, 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 da. <clears throat> um, and they had a, a server called OnLive Talker that was really cool. It was the first thing I'd ever seen where as you got closer to avatars, they had these huge um, lip syncing avatar heads with very low polygons. So nothing that looked exactly like a person, but you would pick an avatar head and walk around in this space, that, which was uninteresting entirely. But if you got close to people, their, vo their volume would go up and down. And the magic behind the platform was that they had figured out a compression scheme optimized for multi-party calls like that. So that all they had to do was they didn't need a big, multi you know, a big multiplexer and a lot of processor power to do that. They had optimized the algorithm to do that. And it was I thought it was really clever and it just disappeared from the world. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think this has, has some relevance to NeoBooks because the NeoBooks is a platform. And, and the question is, you know, where do you, um, I mean, I, I'm much more interested in the quality of the learning community and the experience that people have of collaborative learning and transformational learning. Um, and, um, you know, I just haven't, I don't know where to, you know, uh, go, go brunch is worthwhile, you know, experimenting with and hosting one event just to see whether, I think you need two. One is just to get people oriented to, and I think they tried to do too much on the Zoom call. Rather than thinking they're going to pull it off, they should have just focused on, okay, let's just see if we can get everyone on and do this, this, and this. And then, okay, now that we know how to play, let's come back and play again, which they actually did. They're going to set up another session. So I think they just stretched it a little bit too far for people, but uh, that could have been artifactual because people were trying to use Zoom and this platform at the same time. So... Anytime you start coordinating like Miro plus Zoom, that's a stretch for a lot of people. Oh, it is. Absolutely. We, we tried that. A, we tried that a bunch. 
Now, there's modes in which your video can show up sort of next to the drawing board, which I think works a little better. <clears throat> um, but nobody's figured this out. Yeah. Uh, this. Now I've remembered that uh, I think Complexity Adventures uses Gather too, and they they've used it really successfully. Cool. The um the the um it, it's interesting. I I'll have to look more at Go Brunch. The um um there's an interesting thing between uh being in community synchronously and then and then maintaining that asynchronously. Um, between synchronous sessions um, and communities do that with various uh, various tools and various levels of effectiveness. Um, Discord is kind of, for me, the state of the art of that right now because it has live capacities and it has channels and so forth. I'm not thrilled with Discord servers. There's too many of them. They're very, very chaotic, but they do a nice job of blending sync and async and community and a bunch of other stuff like that. Um, I, the, the community I'm on, I'm on like 15 discord servers. Um, and yeah. one of them does synchronous sessions, but they do it in Google meet. Oh, interesting. So they don't even use the, the discord features. Yeah. Um, Klaus, you've been really patient and coming back onto the call and off the call and you'd like to jump in. So please do. And I'll, and then let's switch back to your topic for a bit so that while we have you, we can sort of wrap that up. I actually have three bars for the moment, hopefully in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I wanted I wanted to ask, what is the status of Substack now? What did we, I, I was reading last minutes, did last meetings, meeting minutes, but it wasn't clear where you want to go with this. Um, what, what are we doing? So um, that was actually where I was going to go once we had all kind of checked in a bit. Um, Pete created a Substack publication for us. Uh, which is, I think, just called open or something like that. But uh, basically, it's an OGM substack for the purposes of NeoBooks. And uh, then he pushed a test uh, post through it just to see how it worked. And so we could all see it when we received it, which worked fine. Uh, and he, it's a test post that he will just uh, delete uh, when we get sort of more, more posts in. And then my assignment for this week was to create uh, an intro to NeoBooks post that would be the first of hopefully many that we'll start posting together through this one Substack account. And I've got a, a better, I've got an, I think, nearly finished draft of the text, but I haven't poured it into the Substack yet. And I was looking at the Substack sort of default banner and stuff like that. We probably have to do a little bit of work configuring uh, Substack so that it looks the way we want it to look and does the things we want it to do. Uh, but we're, we're kind of at that, at that place right now, which means as you refine the thoughts that you were just thinking about, that you were just telling us about, <clears throat> as those things materialize into blog posts, you could publish them through the same Substack. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I was, what I was, the saying before, I may have broken off, is that I would like to create something more user friendly because the language in the first new book is too uh, uh, stiff. You know, it's it doesn't really, it doesn't have a heart. Is what I mean to say. So there, there are some some writers really engage with a sense of humor and personal ways. Um, and and I have to find a way to do that, which is not something I do naturally. Um, but I would really like to find ways to engage um, a more general public, people who are not familiar with the the relationship of food and agriculture, and, you know, your personal uh, consumption uh, uh, biases in. The impact they have on on farmers and regeneration and so on. Um, so for that, I wanted to create kind of a newsletter um, that is more friendly and upbeat and uh, uh, actionable. Um, so a couple suggestions. One is. Uh, so don't give up on the first neo book that you've got. Don't don't think you have to go write something new and different. If you like the logical thread of what you've got in that neo book, 
um, you could uh, probably we could sort of upgrade any any and all of the the nuggets that compose the neo book, and you could make them more funnier. Um, and since ChatGPT is your writing partner anyway, you can turn up the humor level on ChatGPT and ask uh, him, her, it to uh, to use more puns or to use more, uh, appropriate, you know, whatever you want. You can throw it in and it's shocking um, how, how nicely it complies in different ways. Uh, so you could, you could just take a swing at that and say, hey, I'd like this to be written in a more accessible way with some humor. See what, see what ChatGPT comes up. Um, I should but, say that because in the last Zoom call I just did, somebody took the blog post and said, you know, gave instructions, and I'll just I'll just give you the first two paragraphs of there. But it's just very interesting how it, you know, I don't know what the prompts were, but I thought it was quite clever about how it was trying to condense it into something that was, uh, and it's got a uh, um, use, um, it's got a, using soil metaphors and gardening metaphors. So it's it's really, uh, you know, I don't know what he did, <laughs> yep. but he just took it and said, yep, you know, and that's uh, so Klaus. I don't, I mean, Pete, maybe you know more about how to do this, but, um, or maybe you, Jerry, but there are ways in which you can change the style of the presentation to make it more accessible to different audiences, depending upon their metaphorical preferences. Right. Yeah, yeah. I took, I've taken several runs at it, but it just, it just didn't come out the way I feel good about it now uh, to, to have a, a, a language that sort of connects with people that I know the, the way they would, they would engage in this. But I'll try. I, I mean, I'll keep going with it. And so, so my daughter is helping me set up a website. Um, indeed, I have this domain food for thought. Um, and I want, want to elaborate on that a little bit and put an AI section into that. Uh, where I can then link uh, the new books in, in a blog that, that collects these kinds of substacks. But I don't want to, um, uh, I don't want to do something different from OGM, you know. I mean, I don't want to diminish what we're doing with the OGM new project. Sounds cool. Sounds complimentary. Um, go ahead, Pete. I, I wouldn't worry too much about diminishing. I it, it doesn't matter. I don't I I don't think. Yeah. And and in fact, actually I I kind of one of the things I would like us to think through is um this is gonna sound weird, but um uh using ghost and substack together. Uh we we ended up having uh, you know, we made a binary choice and I don't think we needed to do that. Um I, I think it makes sense to have um, potentially both. Uh, so Substack for reach and Ghost for permanence um, on our own domain. Well, so I'm basically still writing the post in Obsidian, pushing it to GitHub for permanence. Yeah. And and my goal is then uh, to have the Substack version of it be, uh, hey, look over here for a mainstream media use of this particular nugget. But the nugget so the post is going to point back to the nugget and the nugget is going to point to a publication of this nugget over there in Substack. So do we then um, still need Ghost? Uh, yes and no, or no and yes. Uh -huh. um, uh, I, I guess my, my, my thought there is to take advantage of Substack because they've got, they, they do the distribution reach thing. Um, but also in, instead of just living in their environment, um, I think the thing to do is to, to use that as a platform that helps build our own domain, basically. So, um, so you're entirely right, Jerry, you know, pointing it doesn't like, theoretically, it doesn't matter too much whether or not it's massive wiki or, or ghost. The thing that would be nice, the thing that I'm imagining is you send out a sub stack. It says, um, you know, this was originally uh, originally posted on, you know, openglobalmind.com, whatever, right? Um, read, read article there. So every time you push a sub stack thing, you're also siphoning a little bit off to maintain your, uh, your own domain. So then um, that domain 
probably wants to be to look more like a blog than than a massive wiki i think <clears throat> but a massive wiki could easily look like a blog i'm and, just saying a massive wiki could easily look like a blog if right. you piece of cake if I mean, you build sure. it that way yeah. yeah well so a massive wiki can also turn like into a wiki or it can turn into an impenetrable impenetrable you know front page or whatever um so so i so then then it the i think it makes sense i like that neobooks is nested within um the ogm wiki um but then neobooks can't be it can't easily be a good blog inside uh, the OGM wiki, I think. So just to catch Rick and Klaus up in case you weren't in those conversations, which I'm not sure you were. So Massive Wiki is Pete's um, project of building something that is a wiki and more using markdown files on GitHub to get version control and sh community editing and shareability and some audience flow and all that. Um, one of the experiments that we'd like to get some funding to code <clears throat> is basically weblog code for massive wiki and Pete fix fix what I'm saying please as as I go but um, by which I mean a weblog is just a collection of nuggets which are markdown files that live somewhere on that uh, repo or vault uh, and they're just organized by uh, chronology and they have uh, interstitial matter so that uh, they look like a blog post. So, you know, you could have the, the retweet, whatever, whatever, a comment section, maybe a header and, and, and a date and, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, the weblog widget in Massive Wiki would say, hey, when you want to create a weblog, create a page, call it a weblog, and then tell me what tag to collect up from all the pages in this namespace or some other namespace to call it a blog. And then when it presents as a weblog, it's just taking any post anywhere in any, any document that's in that vault that has the hashtag Pete's blog would then get rolled up into Pete's blog and, and sequenced chronologically as a weblog. Uh, and you could tag things up, you could do whatever else. But now each post in the blog is actually a wiki page. And that's secret sauce because now each blog post gets all the benefits of, of wiki communal editing etc cetera, etc cetera. does that make sense makes sense to me <laughs> um, um yeah you create a okay. complementarity yeah. yep uh and there's there's a there's a detail on top of that which is um that infrastructure would be useful to take you know, a, a blog that lives inside uh, OGM Wiki. OGM Wiki has a lot of different kinds of articles um, and not much navigation. Um, uh, that that uh, infrastructure would help like, like present a blog nicely out of OGM Wiki. Um, a different thing we could do without the technology overhead is to have a separate massive Wiki that's just the blog. And you can maintain most of that structure just by, just by hand. Um, no, but that's sort but of de be, that defeats some of the purposes. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I mean, it does. I, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm trying to figure out how to make Massive Wiki have a large collection of nuggets that are repurposed for different reasons, yep. and, and that then present differently in the in the appropriate context. So, yep. and and then to use the mycelium metaphor. <clears throat> to me, each of those presentations is a mushroom sprouting from the mycelial substrate. But the important thing is not to carve out the mycelium and to make one be the wiki. That 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 to me like breaks the whole the whole model in some sense. It does. Yeah. It may simplify maintenance, but it doesn't. It it, no, it, it, it uh, gives. I, the the reason I mention it is time to market. Actually, ah, not. Okay. Um, I'm happy to be the the crash test dummy for for all this stuff and just like keep going with OGM Wiki as the the main basis for a lot of these things and that's what I'm I'm writing with that assumption right now yeah that we that we're sort so, of heading in that direction so then it would be nice to resource some technology stuff to to make all that happen exactly I love sharing yeah fireworks going off here yeah. love that you know my favorite of <laughs> course is the laser light show yeah. <laughs> awesome. So, so for for my particular 
Betier here, the, the big thing that came out of the volume one book is that um, the crux of the matter really is the soil microbiome, which um, which determines the, the, the capacity of the soil to absorb and hold water, which in turn uh, drives the hydrologic cycle, which is also called the small water cycle in local areas. And the recognition, the realization that millions of acres of soil have been depleted with chemical uh, forms of agriculture, tilling and chemicals, destroying the soil microbiome, causing large fee areas of desertification, which changed the weather patterns in entire regions, and if globally because of you know, buildings of acres that have been deteriorated. That is a major curveball to the industry that, that is based on monocore practices and doesn't really know how to get around this, because if you want to get into regenerative practices, that means that we have to now rotate crops, we have to uh, adapt crops to bioregions, and so on and so on, which uh, breaks apart the entire supply chain as it's currently conceived. So there is now, and surprisingly, I mean, not surprisingly, I mean, you would anticipate that uh, the recognition of something like this would spurn uh, changes you know that because it is like an existential issue. This not, I mean, this is not a nice to change, or you know, shouldn't we do this? No, I mean, this is truly existential. Um, and and Alan Savory is has been you know propagating this forever. It's being ridiculed and you know shut down and, and all that. So so. Uh, it's, it's, you're starting to break up on us, Klaus. Yeah, we can't. Uh, at this point, you've broken up enough that we're not understanding. So the is talking about... It's better now. Go ahead. Okay. Should I wait for more? Uh, you okay. you now you now sound so better. The Go industry ahead. is pushing. The industry is is waiting the CII carbon intensity index score which is completely ridiculous because it maintains, it, it, it creates slight improvements in, uh, in carbon uh, retention in the soil, but it's non-permanent carbon, it's non-organic carbon, and it doesn't help the soil microbiome to recover. Um, but it has this, this sort of uh, benefit you know, that, uh, the industry wants to reward and they in fact now the biophonio on the current intensity index. And so to bound an information campaign that 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 penetrates that. Uh, and I wonder how many how many uh, issues like this happen in the energy sector, I mean, everywhere you look really, um, uh, also with COP28, you know, amazingly, I mean, it's being boycotted by Regeneration International now, COP28, because what they're doing is just, it's just counter to, it, it's, it's, it's finding more reasons to perpetuate monocrop practices is basically what it boils down to. So, so that's sort of with my volume two, you know, wanting to lead from the future as it emerges, stepping into the future, that that's that's where my my mind is is uh, aiming at to to define. You know, how can you explain this in ways that 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 pushes through, that penetrates, and and uh, and uh, right. counters this kind of misinformation. So I, I just wanted to mention this. This is sort of where I'm, where I'm, I'm leading. You know, this volume two uh, discussion. So, if I may, um, a couple of thoughts on exactly what you're saying, Klaus. Um, one of the things that's very frustrating to me is that ex sort of extremely popular things like cap and trade and carbon capture 
are from the position from the point of view of trying to protect the earth stupid terrible things because they're basically ways of not actually taking action that heals anything no soil is made better they're ways of continuing to pollute while trading away your responsibilities or uh, like hoping somebody else sucks up more of the carbon and so i really don't like those initiatives i find that those are avoidance tactics which is a little bit kind of what you were just saying and you said a little earlier you're trying to switch to the positive and not have something that is a rant or or I'm, I'm sort of putting the word rant on what you said. But I think there's a really good moment because COP28 is just about to start. Um, there's a really good moment to write a very strong piece that says any activity that doesn't actually improve soil health is should be questioned and should be like, I don't I don't even know what the strong way to say it is because some effort to, to help is probably a good effort. But, but if soil fertility is so central and has so many good payoffs, like, like the multiple benefits of soil, of improved soil fertility, um, from water capture to community, uh, forming community to uh, food cre creation, et cetera, et cetera, like it's, it's insane. It's really crazy. So I think, Klaus, if you wanted to write just a blog post that is very strong minded about something like that, I'd be happy to collaborate with you and we could put it through the, the, the sub stack and you could point to it and use it in, you know, in this next coming week because we, we have the sub stack ready to go. You just need to start that, that piece and then I'd be happy to help you polish it and get it out because uh, I, I feel strongly about that. Now, when you started, when you sent leading from the emergent future and the first thing was a profile of Piritim Sorokin, I was really confused. I was just thrown. I did not get a sense of urgency or even focus from what you were trying to write there. So I, I'm, I'm not sure that your beginning of your second piece is doing what you wanted to do yet. Because <clears throat> I, I looked at it and I was like confused. Um, and I get that Sorokin probably has some uh, have really, you know, really important concepts to look at, but you needed to maybe back into them or present them later. But there's the, there's a that that didn't feel to me like it was serving you at the moment yet. Yeah, I mean, this is pretty much like with volume one, when uh, uh, I had uh, apparently three books and it became necessary to explain how they are connected. Now, and so with Zorkin, uh, there's this transition uh, from a sensate uh, society uh, into a uh, what what is it called the uh, uh, a uh, theological not theological but ideational I in, integral and sensate yeah into ideational but right? the, his so, but that whole framework is a is, is a null operator for me trying to build your argument because the moment I start trying to figure out which one is a sensate which one is ideational I was lost yeah yeah I I get that the the way I'm going with it is that. Um, we basically have lost our connection to the to nature and to bios to the biosphere, right? yeah. which has been uh, the ideational form of thinking. So every major religion uh, is really uh, uh, focused on um, what is defined as God, but particularly you know, in Buddhism, it's uh, it's really the world around you, the connection to the to, to life. And the, in a sensate uh, uh, culture, um, these are externalities, right? I mean, nature is a resource uh, that's 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 being used. Whereas in an ideation uh, culture, uh, the environment is part of us. We are part of it, and so that's yeah, you know, sensate materialistic culture, right? And then you have the spiritual culture. So. We need to find a transition, and this is the integrated or the, the, the uh, uh, what what is it the, the uh, integrated society where yes you have uh, uh, the the materialistic component, but you're also uh, res responsible to the spiritual aspects of life. Uh, so the the uh, the integral idealistic culture is the mix of the two. So that's sort of where I was going, right? It's like we need to find uh, a way to return to the spiritual aspect of life because we're killing ourselves. Um, 
and you don't want to be be uh, uh, going into the other extreme because that doesn't really work either. So we need to find a way to where we uh, have our materialistic uh, uh, needs and impulses aligned with the needs of living in harmony with the world around us. Does that make more sense? So you, in, in previous, I think, OGM calls, I'm not sure any of these calls or even some of our other breakouts, but I've, I think I've talked about how I find that the resacralization of the world is really important, that we've managed to make everything just an object and just a raw input. And between capitalism and individualism and the, the objectification of everything, uh, we've managed to make it so that nobody cares about the things that they're doing to the earth and to each other. So I talk a bunch about recyclization, and I only now, from your explanation, understood that Sorokin is likely saying something very similar to that, and that his integral uh, culture is in fact uh, sort of the material plus the, the the spiritual sort of blended. But I did not get that whatsoever until your explanation right now, and I could be wrong. Yeah, and, and then particularly important is Sorokin's um, warning that the transition phase is full of risk and danger because the sensate you know, old culture is hanging on, you know, to, because you have, and, and this when you think about, you know, the whole story talking about how deeply embedded the, the, um, uh, the given power structures really are um, and how difficult they are to unlodge. Um, I think what we're seeing right now, uh, so so that, that we are in a transition phase where there is great risk um, and and uh, danger for, for violence. So this is sort of why, why I brought Sir Hawking in uh, uh, into the discussion. Uh, hey, keep left. Thank you. Keep Go ahead, left. keep left. Love that. Um, cool. Th thanks. Thanks for the explanation, Klaus. That makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, any comments, Rick? Pete? I d maybe a little bit of a tangent, but um, one thing that I'm hearing is how can you manage content more agilely and 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 you know use it more effectively. That's just a sort of brief summary of it. But uh, to me, I want to go back to the process, and that is, well, you know, if Klaus does do this, what are you going to do to to promote it, get engagement? Because you know, there's, it, it, it's just a fire hydrant of stuff out there, and so it really, it really requires a marketing mindset to think. Well, how can you invoke engagement and build community? And and I think it starts within the within your own group. You know, within this own group, how well are people doing this? And this is where you know, using this time as a way of gathering more than the four of us, but actually, you know, maybe every other week there is a feature somebody has written something in advance people looked at it and actually live it and see whether you can sort of um you know cultivate the mycelium uh network where people are learning from each other i mean to me that's the challenge i mean that's oh. a so a couple things. Um, back in the day when social media was young and innocent, there were these things called thunderclaps where uh, a group of people would come together and share their social media accounts. And then they would drop something into the group and say, hey, let's everybody retweet, post, whatever, comment on, like this thing right now. So yeah. we, have a, we have an OGM community where some people might be interested in doing that. Substack creates a little bit of natural traffic because one of the reasons to use Substack is that there's a bunch of people looking through Substacks for what to subscribe to or what to read. So that's one reason why we're over there uh, at this point. So if we did those two things, that would be great. Pete has talked about SEO, which I'm loath to, to, to sort of spend a lot of cycles on, but if somebody else wanted to do that, I'd be thrilled. Uh, but I'm trying to figure out what is the organic way we can build connections and following an audience rather than the inor inorganic manufactured way. And also Klaus has a whole bunch of people that he's been sending individual emails to and in contact with. If he had a place to point to the, a post that is post published and looks like a real article, um, whether it's on LinkedIn or Substack or wherever, that would help him. And then we can kind of echo that and, and fill in more. Uh, Pete, take it away. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks both. Um, Rick, I, I completely agree that um, promotion uh, 
uh, is is critical. I, you know, all the, all this work is not going to not going to matter too much if we don't get uh, don't get the word out. Um, uh, uh, Jerry and and I I don't want to be over associated with uh, SEO. Um, <laughs> I I'm not really interested in SEO, but um, uh, but. Uh, the, the, actually, the reason I mentioned SEO when I did was uh, uh, somebody else had, had mentioned um, uh, timing posts uh, on LinkedIn, for instance. Uh, you know, there's there's a bunch of there's a bunch of mechanical things that you do to get better reach, better distribution, um, and you know, and if you if you do them, you get better reach and better distribution. Um, uh, SEO is one of those things. Uh, you know, it can be certainly be used for evil, but I, I was actually also kind of making the point that whenever you're trying to, whenever you're, um, I didn't really want to talk about this, but maybe I am a little bit. Whenever you're gaming an algorithm, whenever you're going to LinkedIn and posting differently than you would just post, um, you are, you know, you're manipulating yourself. You're trying to manipulate the algorithm you're, you're trying to live within the algorithm to get better reach, you know? So the whole thing is, is really problematic for me. Um, not just SEO, but even things like just mechanically optimizing your, you know, your posting schedule. Um, search engine optimization. False. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so, and yet we also find ourselves in a world, uh, like Rick said, with a fire hose of information, nobody sees anything unless you, you know, work the system a little bit. So, um, so I, I think it's a reality that I kind of have to learn to live with and, you know, and that we have to, to work better. The, where I wanted to go was more to the point that, um, uh, I, I think a couple of things, I think Rick is entirely right that we need to do or that to be read, new books have to have more promotion. Um, I also wanted to make the point that for me, my, my involvement in new books, um, uh, I kind of have the bandwidth. I would love to spend all my time here and do everything new books. Um, I'm, uh, my, my bandwidth is such that I can work on the process of new books, project management, publishing process, um, technology for publishing, technology for moving things from raw, you know, raw sources, uh, Microsoft Word or Google Docs or whatever to into intermediate formats like HTML and Markdown and, and export formats like eBooks and Kindles. And, you know, I can do a lot of that stuff. Um, I have, I don't have a lot of time for writing content and I don't have a lot of time for promoting content. So I, I can imagine, I like Rick's idea. I, I don't know who would attend, um, but I like Rick's idea of regularly having sessions where people are, in my parlance, they would, these are kind of the editing people, uh, edit, editorial people. The editorial team would be digesting books, looking at them, going, okay, and then um, let's think, let's put our promotions hat on and let's promote this. Let's figure out how we want to consume it, how we want to shape it to be consumed, um, how we can push it out to the world, you know, and then goes, I guess for me, it goes from an editorial team to a promotions team or something like that. And those are kind of overlapping, uh, integrated. Um, I, I think we need to do, or I think that needs to be done. I don't think we need to do it. I think it needs to be done. I can also pretty much say that it's not going to be me that does that. So another thing, um, I have this, I have this uh, structural deficit in other parts of, of my organizations, right? I have, I have a number of like organizations I've started or participate in that are dev heavy or product development heavy and marketing light and sales light. Um, and um, uh, I, I love, Jerry, I love your focus on, hey, let's just do this organically. And I also am concerned that that's not going to get very far, um, which may be fine. Um, uh, I, I think 
my, my guess is that that's kind of a way of hoping or getting to do the things that we think are fun and then hoping that something will catch, somebody else will pick it up and, and distribute it, right? Um, I don't think, I, I, I think it's a luck thing that that happens. It's not much more of a, so, so to do it right, uh, to do it more cohesively, more, more holistically, I think just like there are people like me who are like, dude, I'll volunteer for anything as long as it's got markdown on HTML in it. Um, uh, you, you kind of want people who do the same thing, dude, I'll do anything as long as I can post to LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and, and write up uh, editorial calendars and, you know, uh, manage marketing uh, messages and all that kind of stuff. You want those kind of people too, right? Um, and I think that's the way it, it gets done. I think hoping that it will happen um, is not enough. I think it, it actually needs, you know, a team working on it. Um, in the same way that the tech needs a team working on it or it doesn't happen. So um, to close, let me make a short pitch. Um, I'm a re like re-energized around thinking about what I'm currently thinking of as uh, micro startups or nano startups, where you have a, a slicing pie dynamic equity way of um, arranging not so much ownership, but governance and um, and involvement um, and uh, and actively recruiting for the functions that you don't have. You know, if it's tech, you can recruit for that or if it's marketing, you recruit for that or, you know, whatever. If it's just, uh, you know, editorial, reading, writing, pushing, pushing words around, uh, you can recruit for that. Um, I, we don't, there's a lot of things that we don't do in the world because, um, uh, our, our, uh, we have a sister, um, a sister group, uh, Free, Free Jerry's Brain, um, where we did a, a cool development effort, um, and we couldn't figure out how to kind of split up the, you know, the equity governance of it. So we just said, oh, let's just all make it open source, and that works, but it burns people out. Um, uh, Jerry, we, we did get some, thank you again for uh, contributing into the, the fund to, you know, reward the people who made some of that open source stuff. But I happen. thought, but I thought open source was actually our initial goal. What we couldn't figure out is like the rest of it, but we, I, I, my goal was from the, from the start to make sure we wrote some open source software. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm telescoping a, a little bit. Um, okay. uh, we didn't get, I, I think we could have gotten a lot farther with meme brain, um, and maybe brainy McBrain face. Uh, if, um, you know, an, an open source project and we did, we accomplished, I, I don't know, we didn't set out to do a particular open source project. We uh, set out to do some open source in the right vein and we did it. Um, and then, and then nothing happened kind of. Um, we didn't get marketing. We didn't get distribution. Nobody uses meme brain because nobody knows about it because we didn't do marketing for it. So it kind of comes back around to my point. There, there ought to be structure in the world where um, uh, I, because of my background, I think of it as a startup structure, but we ought to have startups where um, the investment capital is uh, a few dozens hours of my time um, or a few hundreds of dollars from some kind donor or, you know, something um, and set up those structures so that we can get persistent work done and persistent gr and growing work done like new books wants to do, for instance. Um, and also, uh, I, I believe that it would be wonderful to have a world where I could say startup and not have people go, oh, um, that means VC, that means millions of dollars, that means cashing out. Let me get on on that. That's what I want. That's not what I'm talking about when I say startup. I'm really talking about we need some way of doing project teams that are more cohesive and more well-rounded um, and, you know, and have reward for the people participating that's not necessarily just about money or not necessarily just about equity even, but about, you know, proportional involvement, proportional kind of say, um, proportional reward of whatever that, that means. Good in the world is a, is a big reward. Um, so for Rick's benefit now, because Klaus has fallen off, uh, Meme Brain and Brainy McBrainface are the names of two <clears throat> pieces of software that are related. 
<clears throat> that were we were using to basically uh, scrape and access my brain data. Well, there were classes back then. Um, Klaus, I was just explaining that brain, meme brain and brainy McBrain face are two project names from Free Jerry's Brain, the Monday call that uh, a little bit later today. Um, and 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 Pete, I think I have to apologize to you then because I saw those two as explorations that weren't close to being productive, production quality useful. Um, they were they were I didn't see them being a thing that could be used by Muggles uh, or near that. And I thought that we sort of stalled at that point for a variety of reasons um, um, about brain access, about whatever else, I don't know. So I didn't I didn't know or even surmise that you, that it was frustrating to you that we didn't try to market it, that we didn't that we didn't go more like this was an offer that could be in the worldview. That wasn't even a thought in my head at the stage that we were at. So I, I apologize for that. I, well, you don't need no apology necessary. And, you know, I, I wasn't frustrated at the time um, because I was glad to have built something. It's a frustration that builds over time. Uh, you and I and Rick and Klaus have spent literally years of our lives working together, building cool stuff. Um, years later now, it seems like less of that stuff gets out in the world than would be nice, you know. Um, and I'm looking to spend more of my time on things that not only are cool, but actually get out into the world, right? So it's oh. it's a, a hindsight observation. It's not, you know, and not in the moment observation. Okay. Um, and, and uh, you know, and back straight to kind of the, the new books uh, call to action and the Klaus's book call to action. All I want to do is, is help save the world, right? Um, and... Klaus has got an amazing amount of information and in the world that we live in, having an amazing amount of information sitting on uh, Google drives is, you know, doesn't Useless. matter. <laughs> so yep. we just need to, we need more traction. You know, that's all I'm looking for. So um, let me, go ahead. Go ahead. Rick. Just tell something you said earlier. I see it as a Venn diagram between the sort of an editorial group, a writer's group and the readership group. In actual fact, I would put the readership group at the head because at the end of the day, if you don't involve your readers, I mean, that's one advantage of Substack, which authors do. They publish things, they get, they get people, get their readers reacting to it. So you test it out in advance rather than producing something and then finding out that maybe it doesn't market very well. So you're constantly testing it. And coming back to your comment about um, nano or micro innovations i mean that's something that could be done internally i mean if we can't do it internally within the group of, of this group then it's not going to happen outside so i mean the first test case really is can you get people within this community more activated because they feel strongly that things have got to change it appeals to their self-interest there's an attractor that makes it people willing to go with it um and to participate but it calls for participation in a different way. The blog post that I shared there actually goes into some of the things I've been experimenting with about how to create, instead of facilitated centered presentation or Zoom calls, how to go towards a group centered process, which is going away from the stage on the stage, the guide on the side, there's, there's plenty of information there. So it's actually trying to create, if, if one creates a more meaningful learning experience, then, it, then and people say, "Wow, that was really worth going to." You know, I, I wasn't multitasking while I was doing. I wasn't checking my email while things were going on. You know, I was engaged, and it caught my attention. And something came out of it that I didn't expect. Um, and that's where you know generative dialogue can be so powerful in, in creating new insights, breakthrough understandings, yada yada. You create this kind of experience. People want to come back for more, better than a Netflix blockbuster series, ideally. So, you know, how do we make it so that people say, I want to participate. This is good. You know, so I think, you know, testing it out internally to the internal market to see whether you can create that sort of energy, then you can go outside. OK, so how can we then uh, use whatever you want to call it, clone, mycelium, whatever it is, the ways that so that it it becomes uh, self-organizing, self-generating because it has to be designed that way. If it's going to be, if you're going to go, if you're going to have any opportunity of amplifying or even better still exponentiating uh, learning opportunities. So that's my two cents. Thank you. Uh, so a couple thoughts to add. I'm not a 
blocking conscientious objector to SEO. It's just not where I want to put much of my energy. That said, as I'm writing titles and uh, thinking of tags and whatever else, I'm clearly thinking about what will snag people's attention and what will make them show up and actually read these things and go forward. So I'm doing a little tiny bit of it myself. And I wrote in the chat that it's very likely that some of the people participating or even lurking in the OGM lists um, are into o o uh, SEO and SEM and would know what to do and so forth. A third thing struck me, which was, hey, why don't we feed a post into ChatGPT as a corpus and say, what are the smartest things we could do <clears throat> to get SEO or, or other kinds of attention for this post? And let's use the intelligence to, to guide us a little bit toward what, what might actually work. I'd be happy to do that as an experiment. It'd be really fun. I think I would learn a ton uh, going there. Then for the NeoBooks project, I've been working us toward getting an output book of some sort that we can show the OGM crowd so that we can then say, now we need help here, here, and here, but here's the thing. And it's pretty much, it's on its way out the door. We have a thing, we have a group who've been working toward it, et cetera. <clears throat> and I felt that until we got near that spot, it was a little bit early to go back into OGM and say, you know, come help us now. Let's go, let's go crazy. Um, it seems that with Substack and given our, tactic or strategy of pre-posting chapters through Substack or nuggets through Substack, the time might be now. And let's just get a couple in the tube and out the chute and then come back to OGM and say, hey, people, uh, let's do this. Uh, a small side note, I think I said last week that there was a guy who was going to be at COP who was I was going to take next Thursday's this Thursday's OGM call to turn to help him out. It turns out he now has a, an important meeting that conflicts with that time. So we'll just have to move that to a different time. So that's not happening. Um, Klaus. Yeah, uh, so so uh, in regard to search engine optimization, that really is the core reason for the inclusion of spiral dynamics into chapter one, um, because we have to think about target audience and the, um, not just cognition, but also worldviews of specific groups. So are we talking to an orange audience or a blue audience? Uh, are we addressing you know, specific subgroups? And and I think, um, I mean, that's basically what uh, marketing PR is doing. You know, the, that's what the political process is doing, and it that and that that you know goes into an area where you know a lot of folks are not really all that comfortable because it's manipulative and all those things. But then, in order to be effective, right? Um, how do we talk uh, about climate change or climate change related issues to a blue audience, for example, that believes in magic and believes. Uh, that uh, these are their higher powers who are responsible for this. And you see that when you follow the news cycle and, and listen in to the conversations, they are clearly, um, they are clearly uh, uh, dominating uh, the conversation out from within their worldviews. Right? So, so, the, so, so we, we, I wanted to set the stage in volume one you know, to to create messages that are target audience specific uh, and and uh, and have us feel comfortable with this because we want to be heard. And in order to be heard, we have to enter the world view and, and, and not uh, bring in uh, uh, ideas that are that are just conflicting and shutting down conversations with people we would like to talk. Klaus, what you're saying first gave me the thought, it's really easy for me to imagine uh, doing what I said earlier about asking ChatGPT about SEO for a nugget and doing that by color layer in the integral model in the spiral dynamics model. And then I had the second idea, oh my gosh, you could start a company called Spiral SEO and market that and, and sell, it, <laughs> sell it in the world. So I, I, I've got your trademark uh, in the chat. Uh, Pete, Pete, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I think I want to break in to say uh, I apologize. Uh, this has been a great conversation, and I think I should should take off. I've got stuff to take care of. Jerry, I won't make it to FJB today. Um, okay. Off having fun at Tide Pools. Oh, sweet. Um, looking forward to continuing the conversation. 
Um, thanks, Rick. Thanks, Klaus. Thanks, Jerry, as always. Thanks, Pete. That's great. Cheers. Cheers. Um, cool. So given everything we've said so far, any additional thoughts or questions or? Well, just, you know, to me, it's it's a question of doing this nano um, innovations, you know, you know, when you have your blog post and actually, you know, um, encourage people to come to Monday or, you know, you may have to do it on a Thursday, which I can never make um, so that it, it um, you know, how can you get people internally excited about the idea? So I don't know when you feel you have something to share in terms of a draft that would be, um, you know, that we can read and comment on before it's published and then take it to the group, get them in there and then say, okay, and you can cross. I mean, I do this all the time now. I, I, I write an article on Substack and do a short one in LinkedIn and vice versa. So there, and then if you do one on LinkedIn, I, I in the past I have done this and it does work, except you've got to get people to to agree to it, which is, if you get a certain number of things within the first two hours on LinkedIn, I mean, you know, if that's the name of the game and you don't have any control over it, then it does help if you can get people to uh, make comments on it um, from the get go and it'll help, you know, push up some of the exposure. So, yeah. So as I was saying a moment ago, my original goal was to get a draft kind of ready for publication and then go back to OEM or OGM and say, Hey, look, let you know, help us do this, et cetera. Now that we've got the Substack, I think if we can if we can publish two Substack posts that are substantive and interesting, uh, and then mirror those in uh, on the OGM wiki and sort of show what this is and how it works, uh, I think that's a, that's a much nearer goal, yeah. and uh, it's a place where we could uh, go back to the group and say join us on Mondays. And I, I have no problem inviting many more people to come join us on on these calls. This would be the right place to do it. Well, the, 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 the thing about what I'm talking about is sort of pre-marketing really, mm -hmm. and it's pre-marketing internally so that, um, before something's even published, you're actually generating interest in it. Mm -hmm. so they've got an advance warning when it's going to be published and, you know, you can, um, you know, post it other places as well, or links to other places so that people do the same thing. But it does, I mean, to me, that's, that's, um, you know, if, if we're not effectively promoting each other, then. You know, if we can't do it in ourselves, it ain't going to happen outside of ourselves. Yep. Yep. Totally agree. So. Totally agree. I'm game to play. Good. Thank you. Uh, Klaus, any other thoughts? No, I'm I'm good. And uh, I'm about to get into, into a mountain range where I can cut off anyways. And I'm thinking we we've, we've done a lot. This feels like a a call we can wrap right now. And uh, uh, just, just one last quick comment. Yeah. And this is one of the things that I find with, you know, the whole climate change aspects of it, all this advocacy, regeneration, whatever, is that unless you go upstream uh, beyond that and look at the political corruption, power structures, yada yada, you know, I mean that's why COP is not going to. I I don't know if many people are particularly optimistic about it. Uh, I, I'm certainly not. And the question is, unless you're actually calling out the power structures that make it difficult to actually do something, then just pure advocacy for climate change by itself uh, is is swimming against the stream. So, and, and, and you know, the, the, we had a brief discussion on uh, the, the election in Argentina. And when you when you think about it, uh, while we were there, you know, we are traveling with school scholar, uh, and you always get a lecture, and you have some professor come and talk and so on. So we got uh, an overview of the election. There were three candidates running, uh, and there was a huge demonstration outside our hotel. The you know, street shut down during that time. Um, so it was quite interesting. So what what it turned out is that the guy who won is actually paid for by, you know, the richest people in Argentina. And this one guy, you know, this group that owns all the airports, they own like major hotel chains and um and they, you know, is uh, is back to the old Milton Friedman approach of uh, privatize everything, you know. Exactly. And it, and and the most disturbing part of all of this is that climate change is just not real. No. At the same time, Argentina 
this year had major crop failures you know, caused by climate events. Yeah. So so it's it's a tragedy unfolding in front of the eyes, right? Um, and and so so that and this is why I'm also open in on this, you know, on this discussion because and you read this one paragraph where he's saying the transition period. You have established bureaucracies, established power structures hanging on with ever more regulations, ever more tightening down, you know, doubling down on on what clearly doesn't work, but preserving it and in the process, ramming it deep into the ground, making it more difficult to turn away from. And that's exactly the the the, the space we're in right now is extremely dangerous. Yeah. And and you see it how um you have concentrated wealth dominate global politics. Exactly. You know, COP twenty eight, I mean Bill Gates, my God, I mean the guy uh is influencing the World Economic Forum. You have McKinsey coming up with insane ideas you know, of how to use technology technology and innovation to create, you know, a new reality, completely ignoring the socioeconomic impacts of their ideas, you know, and, and the climate impacts of their ideas. So, so that's yeah. So it's what people are saying we want to save the world, <laughs> but but it is sort of where where my thought is. And I think we're all at the same on the same page here. Well, to, to, to end on an even more pessimistic note. Oh, good. If the Netherlands <laughs> can go right, I mean, that is just, um, I have, you know, Dutch colleagues, and I, I haven't been able to touch base them about what they think is, what the hell is going on in the Netherlands with Gert Wilders coming into power? I mean, the, the, the swing to the right is just, and if we don't, if we don't start taking on these issues, then we'll be, we're, we're cooked. Because we have a, an act, that's the whole point of that blog post actually that I shared is that we have, you know, um, incompetent, uneth unethical governance, yada, yada. We don't have to go into details now. But anyway, um, <clears throat> upwards and onwards, right? For the good so, fight. So here's the, here's uh, Millet and Wilders win big. They both won like in, in landslides. Um, here's the rise of the European rightists. Here's the global shift to the far right. I've been tracking this for a while. I added this thought in 2016. Can you share a link? I, of it? Sure. Yeah, that'd be cool. Coming up. Uh, let me just uh, get to the chat. I mean, bottom line really is that we have to reduce consumption uh, because the Western uh, US and, and Western I mean, European and uh, consumption patterns are clearly unsustainable, and the and, and so we are coming from this high uh, to to convincing a lot of people that we have to you know power down, and uh, no one really wants to. Now, yeah. and there's no way of, uh, and no one really. Uh, and and I think if there was responsible leadership, uh, you know, it could be it could be packaged. But there isn't, you know, and and so so yeah, we are we are in a, in a really bad in a really bad yeah, space. Yeah. It's a pickle. Um, cool. Thank you very much, Klaus. Thank you so much for dialing in while you're driving. We really appreciate it. It's been it's worked out. Yeah, I should for, say, you should say thank you to my partner. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. All right, all right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye -bye. See you.